Good morning. It's good to be with you together. I'm glad that I can be here with you. It's an opportunity and a privilege for me. And I think we all feel that way, right? That's why we keep coming back. And we like to, we like to be here. It is enjoyable to be with uh, other, just with friends, never mind with other folks who are also journeying in the journey of, journey of faith. And we believe in the goodness of God, right? Who believes in the goodness of God this morning? There are some. That's good. And uh, maybe there are a few. Some weren't listening. And that is fine too. And uh, there's some here... And I was thinking about that. I've been conscious of that this morning. There's some families here with young children. Many of them are sitting out on the back. There's some, if you look around, you can gladly look around to the back. Those who are in the front, there's families out in the back, moms, dads, who are having little children on their, on their laps. And uh, that's not my privilege anymore, unfortunately. I can still hold them on my lap, but it doesn't happen in church anymore. And so it's a privilege. And I just want to say, God bless you. You know what, if they're a little bit loud sometimes, if they all wake us up sometimes, and it's God speaking to us that he is good, he's blessing us with children, he's blessing us with families, and it's okay. I mean, if they drown me out, then you need to leave, I think. (laughs) Maybe then I should leave. They don't do that, right? So it's fine. You're welcome here. Your little children are welcome here. We're glad that you are here with them together. And uh, so please be at... Please be at peace and everyone. And uh, so we believe in the goodness of God. Psalm 27 uh, verses 13 and 14 say, David said, I believe it was David. He said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So David, he, he said, it sounds by this one verse. If we just take this one verse, it sounds like his life was so hard. That if he had not believed that he would one day see God's goodness in this life, he would have just fainted. He would have given up. That's what, he, that's what it sounds like to me. But he didn't give up. Why not? He did not faint. That's the point. The point isn't that he almost did. That's natural that we know. That's a temptation for all of us sometimes. But he said, I believe. I did not faint. I did not give up because I believe in the goodness of God. I believe God is good. And I don't just believe that God is good. I believe that I will see that God is good. And then he says, verse 14, this verse that we comfort each other with sometimes. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So that is God's word to us today as well. From The mouth of King David, the man that we admire so much in many things. And he said, you know what? I would have fainted. I went through a lot of hardships. The previous verses uh, would put this into context. But he said, I would would have fainted, but I believed that I would see God's goodness in my life. And so he's telling you and me, if that's how you're feeling this morning, you're feeling that life is tough, you're feeling life is hard. No, you believe. You will see God's goodness in this life. And in the land of the living, that could refer to heaven as well. But we will see the goodness of God. And that is what we hold on to. I saw something very interesting the other evening. I was <clears throat> outside. I Sometimes I'm outside in the evening. Often, actually, I like to be outside in the summer uh, during the day when it's hot, but also in the evening. And so I was uh, observing uh, something very unusual. I observed this. I saw the stars and different things. I wasn't really focusing on that. Uh, but then I, then, I saw, then I saw something that uh, made me do a double take just for a split second. And I saw, I, like, it looked like a jet line. Like, you know, during, we sometimes see a jet with a long white line behind, right? We've all seen that. Uh, and it's good to see that, right? It means somebody is living and happy and going about business and doing stuff, right? And... Uh, so I saw, but this was, so I saw, oh yeah, it's in the dark, nice evening, stars are shining brightly, and there's a jet with a line coming behind it out in the west. And you know, there's so many unbelievable things that I happen, I didn't even think about it much. I said, oh yeah, there's a jet. And I thought, now yesterday I thought, well, well, why wouldn't jets have glow in the dark smoke or whatever that is, right? That would be kind of nice. But in that moment, I just thought, okay, there's a jet with a line behind it, but then later I thought, well, but that can't be, that's impossible. Right, you, that doesn't happen. But I uh, didn't focus on it on it further. But then, in a, another minute, I saw again 
and I saw, oh, there's a, there's a, it's like a floating stick. It's like a train, flying train in the sky. Like, what is this? Like, and so I looked and obviously, yeah, there's a string of lights at about this long, just one right after the other, just floating gently and quietly through the sky. And then it faded from view from the front to the back and all of a sudden it was gone. And if I didn't have, hadn't had friends with me, I would probably have thought I was going a little bit crazy because who would expect something like that? So I Googled this thing and yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> it uh, made me think of Elon Musk and I think it had to do something with that. So a row of satellites. And so I saw, well, last evening, like the next night, yes, which was la yesterday evening, they were supposed to come by again. And so I looked up what time, and there was a tracker, and you can put down your location, and, and you can, it tells you when you will see them. If you look up, I guess, if they pass over your, where you are. And so they were supposed to pass again at 10.15 last evening, and so I went out, and sure enough, there was a, we waited for a while, they were maybe a little bit late, or maybe I was just impatient, but sure enough, all of a sudden I saw, yeah, there's that jet coming again. So yeah, there's a string of satellites. So some of you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. I don't know if they'll be visible again. I haven't searched that you can do if you're interested. We're not all interested in that. But here I saw something that was unbelievable, but uh, you know, I don't know what my grandparents would have thought if they had seen something like that, but we already are used to unbelievable things and I'm sure they had them too, but different ones. And so yeah, there was a, it was like a thing that, that was just there. And so it reminded me of somebody who, who made that, right? So that is, it reminded me of Elon Musk and all his engineers. You know, somewhere is probably a skyscraper or some big office complex with engineers, lots of them sitting at computers and, and they're managing this thing, right? And so that's what it made me think of. And then it made me think of God who gave the power and the creativity and the laws of nature to be able to do something like this. They probably don't believe in God, I don't know. But, uh, but they're still using the laws of, of God. And so I thought, okay, well, that's a man-made thing. That's not the glory of God, right? Yeah, sure. No, that's just man-made. That's not the glory of God. But then I thought, well, for sure it is the glory of God because without the orderly laws of God, something like that could never work. Without the intelligence that God has given even ungodly people, something like that could never work, right? And so God works in all kinds of ways. And so I, uh, and I realized, okay, so here's this unbelievable thing. So it's like a miracle almost. And it makes me think of the people who made it and financed it. And uh, so what is it doing? Is it uh, scanning me for something? Like, well, what does it all give? No, of course not. So I thought, okay, but it, it can. I could connect. I think there is something I've heard uh, that uh, that is an internet provider, right? I don't know. Some of you know. But I think I've heard you can hook up to your internet to Starlink, right? Some of you would probably know. Somebody told me. Okay, so it's an internet service provider, right? So I could, my phone and my uh, Wi-Fi at home and all that, I could probably hook up to that thing, right? And so now I would have that. I've seen this sign and there's the people behind it and I could have, take that into my pocket, right? And power my life off of that, right? My WhatsApp and my work and my message preparation and all that I could, I could uh, power off of that and it could be a provider to me. I mean, I don't know what those are specifically. I don't really care, but uh, yeah. So that's, I'm drawing a little bit of a, of a thing here for us. And uh, <clears throat> it, it would be, you know, if I subscribe to that, I, would, I wouldn't need to use it. Uh, like even if I, if I subscribe to that service, but I could. And uh, whenever I wanted to do something online, I could use it. I mean, I wouldn't need to see that thing flying through the sky in order to believe in it or to experience its power. I would just need to use my phone and I would be experiencing the power of the satellites or whatever that is. All right, well, let's leave that story behind. Maybe it's a little bit scatter or a little bit uh, silly or whatever to every day for Sunday. But yeah, that, that was that. And so I was thinking about that. Uh, it came to me as I was preparing this message. I thought, well, okay, there's an example for us. You know what? Um, our message today is called Jesus, the sign of Jonah, for those of you who are putting this up. Uh, but Jesus, the sign of Jonah. You know what? You, if you are like me, then you sometimes like a little bit of extra power from God. Sometimes we like uh, something that will help us in our faith. Uh, 
And I don't think that is wrong necessarily. But so we want to look a little bit at the sign of Jonah, but we'll start first with Gideon. Uh, we could read, maybe you want to, we won't read the chapter, but you could turn to Judges chapter 6 and just scan along. I made some notes for myself uh, about Judges chapter 6. We won't read through the whole chapter. It would be very interesting. Uh, maybe you want to read it in the afternoon if, uh, or some other time. But Judges chapter 6 tells the story of a man named Gideon. And we know the story, but let's think about it a little bit. Gideon, I have always had the impression that, or and I think that's maybe I di didn't understand what they were saying. I always thought that Gideon was like a poor man. He was very weak, all right? He was very, you know, um, discouraged, you know, the way I sometimes feel. But the Bible says Gideon was a mighty man of valor. And yes, he says, I am the least in my household, but the Bible describes him as a mighty man of valor. So in other words, he was a valiant man. He was courageous. But yet this courageous and mighty man of valor uh, was threshing his grain somewhere in secret because he was afraid. The enemy had come. They had taken over their territory or were going to or threatening to. And so he had some grain here and he was, had hidden somewhere in a different place. And so there he was secretly hoping that the enemy would not come and steal his grain. Maybe that's why I've thought of him as afraid or whatever. And I guess he was afraid a little bit. He was anyway hiding but he was courageous enough to do that. So he was there threshing his grain. And, and the Bible says in Judges 6 that an angel of God came to sit under a tree and uh, gave him a message to fight the enemy. So um, that was an unusual thing. So here Gideon was seeing something unusual. Like I saw something unusual. Uh, this man, I don't know how this angel looked. Did he look very different or did he look just like an average guy walking down the street? He did have a walking stick, we'll find later. So maybe he looked pretty normal. Uh, if he did, I don't think the Bible says uh, that that would explain some of Gideon's other actions. But this angel told Gideon that, uh, oh, well, one backdrop to the story is that the, the people of Israel, the Hebrews, uh, the children of Israel, they had been uh, asking God to deliver them, right? And he wasn't delivering them. And so they were living under this fear. They were living under this oppression and their goods were being stolen and taken away by the enemy. So that is the backdrop of this. And so the angel tells him like, you will be the means of, of deliverance. And, uh, and so Gideon uh, is kind of questioning that, I guess is kind of doubting, is kind of wondering about this. And it doesn't say that God has a problem with that. The angel said, well, bring out your gift. Right, he expected, I guess, when a traveler came like that, you'd give him, give him a gift, give him food, give him water to help him on his way. And so Gideon went and he brought a kid. So I guess it, like this is an all-day event, right? Not as fast as we live. So he, I guess he roasted or grilled a, a, a kid, a goat kid, and brought the food and drink. And he brought it to this traveler, right, to this angel. And so the angel said to him, well, put, put it here on this stone. You'll find it in, in, in Judges 6. Put, put the food that you have brought, put my gift on this stone. And so Gideon did that. And then the angel takes his uh, walking stick and he touches the food that's on the stone. And I always thought till this morning that fire fell from heaven and burned up that offering. It's not true. It says fire came out of the stone and burned it up. It's not significant. It's just an interesting detail. And fire came out of the stone and burned up that food that Gideon had brought. And so now Gideon knew, oh, now he was very afraid. And so the angel departed then, but Gideon, he left. But Gideon stayed there and he was, he was afraid. He said, alas, for I have seen uh, the angel of God. Something like that, he says. But then God speaks to him. The angel is gone, but then God speaks to him. He says, don't be afraid, be at peace. So Gideon was to uh, do this thing that God had told him. And uh, so that night, when Gideon had retired, I don't know if it was in a dream or if he was sleeping anyway, that night, God told Gideon to get up and destroy the altar of Baal in his town and the grove that was around it. So it was a place of great wickedness and idolatry in his village. And he was supposed to destroy it. So he took 10 of his servants and they went and they cut down all those trees and they destroyed the altar of Baal. And it was a huge deal in their village the next morning when the people found out that the altar of Baal, so these were the Israelites, right? 
the altar of Baal, they were really mad. They were really upset that Gideon had dared to destroy the altar of Baal. And so Gideon's father kind of comes to the rescue and says, well, if Baal is a god, then let him take care of it himself. I won't fight for Baal. He can take care of that himself. Okay, so then on and we'll just fast track through it. But then a little time later is when the time comes. Okay, Gideon, now it's time for you to go and conquer the, conquer the enemy. And so now Gideon, having seen the angel, having seen the food burn up, having had the power to tear down the altar of Baal, but now he's supposed to go and fight these enemies that are much stronger than them. And so Gideon wavers a little bit, or he wants reassurance from God. And so he says to God, okay, God, you know what? Um, I'm not unwilling to do that, but uh, let, me, let me have a sign from you. So I'll put out a fleece from a, from a lamb and, uh, or from a sheep, and I'll put it on the ground overnight and uh, let... Like, you know, you've walked outside this morning, right? The last few days and your shoes got all wet. Did you do that? Did that happen to you? It was very wet on the grass, right? And so that's what happened there too. There was dew in the morning. And so Gideon said to God, I will put this fleece like this wool outside. And if in the morning there is uh, dew only on this fleece, on this wool, then and none on the ground beside it, then I'll know that it is you that is talking to me. That's you that want me to do this. I thought, okay. Well, then God did that, right? So God is very long-suffering. And then the next, uh, and then that day he said, well, God, I need another sign. So I guess what was going on in Gideon's, Gideon's heart? We don't really know. I suppose we can imagine or assume. But the next night he says, okay, God, this night let's do the opposite. This night I'll put out a fleece again. This night then in the morning I'd like to have the fleece all dry and just do on the grass, none on the fleece, right? And so God does that. So he's, the next morning when Gideon gets up, then the fleece, the wool is completely dry, uh, but just the grass or whatever is beside it was, was wet, right? So this, with this faith emboldened, he gathered an army of thousands of men, and then at God's word, he reduced them several times till he had only a few hundred, or how many were there left? Somebody know? There's only a few men, well, maybe several hundred. Anyway, it was a much smaller army, a big, re, largely reduced army, he was left to face the enemy in a very unusual way. And God told them how to do it with the pitchers, right? And the lamps in there and they broke them, right? What an unconventional way to fight an army. And so clearly the victory that they won there that night and they routed the enemy was the working of God, right? But it also was the working of God through a man who believed God, right? I mean, he fumbled. He, we would say, well, Okay, but he believed God, and God had a plan. God knew now's the time to redeem my people from these enemies, and we will do it now. And who will I use? Well, let's do Gideon. And uh, so Gideon went along with God. So God had a plan that was bigger than Gideon. God's plan wasn't about Gideon. God's plan was about routing the enemy and freeing his people. And so he used Gideon. Gideon went along with God, but he needed some signs along the way, and God gave them to him. And uh, that's the story of Gideon in a nutshell. The Bible talks more about him. He uh, did not stay very strong in faith or whatever. He uh, made some mistakes later in life. But that is that story of Gideon that we are the most familiar with. Well, we also have Noah, right? Noah also received a message from God. That was God's plan. It was a much larger thing. This thing did not about the ark, the flood, had really very little to do with Noah. It was God wanted to accomplish something. He told Noah that, uh, the way I understand, in 120 years, the earth will be flooded. And uh, so you prepare an ark for yourself and for your, the saving of people, for the saving of humanity, and uh, you, you do that. You go build an ark. And so what did Noah, we do not find, as far as I know, that he asked God for a sign. Noah took his ax, headed out into the bush and started chopping down trees. That's what I understand from Noah. And uh, so that's what he did. He endured a lot of spite because of this, but he persisted. We don't find that his faith wavered. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't, we don't know. He just obeyed God, he built that ark. And when the time was ready, God sent the rain and the ark was put to good use, the use that God had planned for it. So that's Noah. Noah does not ask for a sign, and yet he believes and he obeyed God anyway. He believed God when he heard his word. There was the Zechariah, right? The priest in the first part of the New Testament, the father of John the Baptist. 
the angel came to him. Again, he was, not, he was just going about doing his job, and all of a sudden, the angel stands right beside him and says, well, you will have a son, and call him John, and uh, he will be a great man. Anyway, what the, the message that angel said, told him, I believe he told him that, that he would prepare the way of the Messiah. Anyway, Zechariah and his wife were old already. He didn't believe that they would have a son yet. Like They were too old for that. Uh, they were like retired. They were like uh, seniors. Like, no, we won't have, have a son. They didn't have any children as far as I understand. And so I don't think he said anything to the angel, but the angel still like, God knows your heart and God knows my heart. God knew. The angel saw that this man, poor Zachariah, he doesn't believe my words. And so he said, well, I'll give him a sign. You won't speak another word until your son is born. And so that's the way it was. And when the little baby boy, that they, he called him John, and I believe when he called him John, when he, he wrote down on a paper or whatever, right, that his name is John, then he could speak again, right? And so that was, again, God's plan. Like God has, this had not as much to do with Zechariah as what it had to do with God's plan. Like in the Old Testament, we find prophecies of the one who would prepare the way of the Messiah. And so here's Zechariah, and he's now the instrument of God's fulfilling his plan, and he is doubtful. He doesn't really believe, but so God gives him a, gives him a sign, and it is fulfilled the way God had said. And uh, obviously, Zechariah was not disobedient, but uh, yeah, he had trouble believing what he was seeing and what he was hearing from God. So there's are some signs. There's another sign, which gets to the sign of Jonah that Jesus told the Pharisees about. That we find in Matthew chapter 12. And so it's a, also a... a a lengthy story that we could that we could consider that we could talk about or read the whole chapter but basically what had happened here it's a very sobering story actually uh, there was a there was an instance where they were having the sabbath right so this is back now in in jewish jewish territory they were trying to observe the jewish laws of the old testament which was good that wasn't wrong but they were being ruled by the pharisees who were going overboard with a lot of things and adding a lot of things to the word of god and uh and uh, exercising a lot of power that God hadn't meant for them to have. <clears throat> and uh, so here's, they are on the Sabbath, and Jesus heals the hand, the withered hand of a man. So here's a man who had a hand that was withered, right? And so uh, there are people, and we probably know, I don't know if there's anyone here today, but, you know, he couldn't use his hand. Something happened to his hand. Maybe he was born that way. We don't know. But his one hand was, it says, withered. It was useless. He couldn't use it to work, right? So that would really really be a problem for one, right? But Jesus healed this man. He had pity on him. Then the Pharisees were angry at Jesus for healing this man on the Sabbath, right? Their laws, their, uh, their idea of the law had been, had been broken. And so this was, we read in Matthew 12, that it was a fulfilling of Isaiah, right? Isaiah prophesies about the Messiah, tells he would help the broken and the weak until he got victory. And it says, in verse 21, if you are in Matthew 12, verse 21, it says, in his name, the Gentiles would trust, right? The Jews are left out of that sentence. There were many Jews who believed in him, but it says many times in the Old Testament that the Gentiles will trust in the name of Jesus. And uh, so that is told here, and, and it is inserted here into this incident of the Pharisees not accepting the miracle that they plainly saw. I mean, if you saw Jesus heal, if you saw somebody heal a withered hand, would you believe well, you know, sometimes we might have a problem. And it is true that the devil can also do miracles, I think. That is, I mean, we see that also in the Bible, right? I mean, the servants, astrologers of Pharaoh, they did a miracle there with the snakes, uh, it appears, and so on. There are some different things. And so, uh, so there might be some reason to doubt, hey, you know what, is this from God? Because it's possible that it wouldn't be. But the, the Pharisees having a cold and unbelieving heart toward God, they, they, they just plain rejected the work of God. And so um, that, is, that is what the, situ the hardness of heart that they were in. They had no room for God in, in their heart. They had no faith toward, toward who God actually, actually is, right? And so they had, they had seen him. And so now they accused, they accused Jesus of using the power of Satan to heal this blind and dumb man. That, that is in the next verses. Uh, there was a demon-possessed man. And he was blind and dumb uh, by the spirits that had possessed him. 
And so Jesus drove out the evil spirit from him. That is after verse 21, I believe. And so there uh, they ascribed that and said, you know what? The Pharisees came to Jesus and said, you are doing this by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of the devil. You have driven, driven the devil out, right? So that is, they were blaspheming the power. They were blaspheming this Holy Spirit of God. And that Jesus said, that is something that, that uh, God will not forgive. And uh, so the Pharisees did not believe. They uh, ascribed the work of God to the devil. And so in the clear face of the miracle uh, that Jesus did before their eyes, and they knew Jesus, they had seen, they saw his character, they knew his character, they knew all the miracles that he had done, Uh, they knew a lot of these things, they knew that the people said he is the son of David, just a few verses before that, after one of the miracles, the people are saying, isn't this the son of David? And that means they were ascribing Jesus to be the Messiah, right? So that's what the people believed, and so but not the Pharisees. And so then then the Pharisees come to him. And so Jesus, when Jesus tells them, um, uh, and so bear with me, but when Jesus tells them that, uh, okay, you're ascribing the work of the Holy Spirit to the devil, and he says, that's a blasphemy. Uh, So blasphemy was very, very serious, uh, still is. Then the Pharisees come back to him, and now they said, okay, so now they were pretending, right? Now, okay, we want to be repentant too. Now we want to be good people too, and so give us another sign, and then we will believe. That's what they say in the next verses, right? Just give us another sign, some sign, and then we will believe. That's what they were saying in in essence. And so that's when Jesus says, tells him about the sign of Joseph, uh, Jonas. And so God is very merciful as he was to Gideon, as he was to Zechariah. He says, okay, I will give you a sign. I would have always thought, okay, Jesus didn't give him a sign, but actually he did. He said, you will have one sign. It's only one sign. It won't be right now. You will see the sign of Jonah. Like Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and nights. And that will be your sign, and that will be the only sign that you will see. So in other words, Jesus gave himself as a sign. Jesus offered himself to them, but they did not believe it. Very interesting. If you think about the resurrection morning of Jesus in the context of this episode, what happened when these same Pharisees were presented with a group of frightened Roman soldiers? Okay, we don't know very much about soldiers. We know a little bit. We hear stories sometimes. Like soldiers are tough, right? They're not supposed to be afraid. And if they are, then you don't hide it. Then you just do something violent, I guess. I assume, I don't know. Soldiers we would typically see as they're the toughest, right? And so when the Pharisees were presented with, were visited by a group of frightened Roman soldiers, they had just fallen down as dead before the resurrection power of Jesus. And they came into the city and told the Pharisees, this man whom you told us to guard, this body you told us to guard and you paid us for, whatever, he rose and the angel came and there was an earthquake and the stone rolled away. And right, that's in the situation which these Roman soldiers came to the priests and Sadducees and Pharisees and said, that's what happened. We saw this man rose from the dead. The soldiers knew that. They had seen it, right? They couldn't deny it in their heart. What did the Pharisees do then when they heard about the sign of Jonah? They said, Shh, quiet. Don't let this get out. Here's money. Go and tell everybody that the disciples stole the body of Jesus, right? They did not believe the sign that God gave them. And so the Pharisees went on in their unbelief. So that is an amazing thing to me when I think about that. <clears throat> Jesus, so here was a sign from God that God said he would give them. Uh, They didn't believe it. In effect, they fought against it. They paid money. They paid bribes. They worked against what God was revealing to them and what he had said he would tell them. And so I think elsewhere in Acts, I think we find that many of the priesthood at least believed in Jesus, likely I don't think any of the high priests, but maybe some of these people, people later believed in Jesus. We don't know. It doesn't say in that detail. But most of them just completely hardened their heart against Jesus. Um, so Jesus was right. They were a faithless and a perverse generation, an adulterous generation, unbelieving. Their fake man-made kingdom 
that they had hijacked on the back of the real kingdom of God was not of interest or of value to the purposes and plans of God. All the other places we saw, God had a plan. And here God had a plan too. But uh, these folks who could have worked with God, they refused to. When Actually, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, they did the same thing again. You remember what the Pharisees or the high priest said to Jesus? I'm kind of lumping them together as a group because they functioned as a group. So I think it's fair if I do that. What did they say? Then they again came to the... Well, they didn't... They said spitefully to Jesus, right? They said, if you are the son of God, then come down from the cross, right? Then we will believe, right? That's kind of the the game they were playing with God. If you are the son of God, then come down from the cross and then we will believe. So where are we going with this? The thoughts that I will share or I'm trying to share are thoughts I hope will help you. There are thoughts that are for me as well. I've prayed over this message and, and uh, I think God uh, wants to speak to me and also to you. Maybe not to all of you, but maybe a few of you. And so I think we are sometimes like these people too. I think it's very human to desire a sign from God, to desire a reinforcement of our faith. I don't think it's wrong to desire that. Uh, Are there things in your life that you're stalling over? Are there things in our lives that we're waiting for? Um, I don't know what it could be. It could be a a whole lot of different things. Maybe it could be a victory in your personal life. Maybe it could be a a calling that you know God has for you. Um, it It could be a decision that you want to make or you're not sure about. Maybe you know which direction God would want you to go, but you don't like that direction. I guess maybe like Noah or like Gideon. They didn't like the direction that was going either. Jonah certainly didn't like the direction that God was calling to him. He said, well, God, if I go preach to the people in Nineveh, then they will repent and you'll have mercy on them. I don't want to go and preach to them. Um, So there, maybe, maybe it's something like that. So one question that I had to face as I was uh, reading or thinking about these incidents that we have just talked about was, I would always have thought that Gideon has a stronger faith. He was a man of strong faith, and he was. But did he have stronger faith, or did Noah have stronger faith? Noah, we don't find that much about him. Um, I mean, as far as his faith, he didn't, I don't think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think he asked God for any special signs. He just sharp, went and sharpened his axe and went to started chopping trees, right? That's what it sounds like. Gideon, and I'm not condemning Gideon, I'm just saying he needed several signs from God. He had already seen the rock, fire come out of the rock and burn up his food. He had had God talking to him. <clears throat> he had the power of destroying the altar of Baal. He had the two different signs of, of the fleece. And uh, so then he was convinced. He needed that reinforcement. And that, I don't find that that was wrong. He just needed it. He was doubting. He, was, he needed the reassurance from, of God. And so uh, I guess my question uh, for us is um, maybe maybe we are stalling over something. Are we waiting for, for, what are we waiting for from God? Are there things that that are actually clear to us, but well, we're, we're stalling over it because we're waiting for the power of God. We're waiting for Jesus. Well, one thing for you to consider is what are ways that God has helped you in the past? God does sometimes encourage us in special ways. Have you ever experienced any of those? When we are about the work of God, I think that is, we find that these were projects that God had. God wanted to accomplish something, and so he needed people to help. And so then God helped along because he wanted to move the plan along. God has given us the sign of Jonah, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God has told us that he would come again. He said... He would prepare a place in heaven for us. He said he would come and receive us and take us there. In the meantime, what were we supposed to do? He has given us a lot of things to do. We were to be busy teaching all people about him. We were to be busy growing in personal holiness and sanctification. A lot of things that we are to do going about our life that we know. They're not things that we don't know. They're very clear to anyone who reads in the New Testament what we are to do. There's, it's not hard to understand. But sometimes, maybe you and I are like Gideon, where we prefer the supernatural. We prefer to see some 
majestic event that would be very impressive to us. Sometimes, and I've experienced this in the past, I think sometimes when we are looking for a sign from God, maybe to make a decision, sometimes it can be just irresponsibility on our part. So it's too hard for me to make the decision, then I'll ask God to make a sign and show me, right? Maybe it is obvious what I should do. If I really would think about it, I would know. But, you know, it's easier if God would give me a, a sign and then I would know. It could be, not necessarily. I think God shows us and he wants to show us like he did Gideon and like he did uh, uh, some other people, right? He does, it's not that that is wrong necessarily. I'm just, I guess I want to challenge us in our, in our faith and the things that we already know. Uh, you know, what are the signposts in your life that you are in the right direction, that you are following uh, your faith, that you are following the calling that you have been, that you are going in the direction that God wants you to go, so to fulfill his purposes for his, his kingdom. You know, the greatest thing when I think about my life, I think the biggest thing, the biggest sign that God has given me is the faith in the, in the forgiveness and the adoption and the calling of God, right? Isn't that the biggest thing that we have, that we can uh, agree with the verse that says, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? <clears throat> Sometimes we make our own life difficult by living contrary to the word of God, and we're stalling for the power of God. Yeah, we'd like to see signs from God. In the meantime, we're busy making our own life hard. Maybe we all do that sometimes. And we long for the power of God. Well, the Bible invites us, God invites us to seek and to knock, to pursue God. And he will review. It's not that God doesn't want us to know. It's not that God is trying to keep his kingdom off the earth. He actually desires it more than we do. What God is waiting for is for people who are willing to work with him. Uh, his eyes, the eyes of God, it's in Chronicles somewhere, it says the eyes of the Lord are searching for somebody whose heart, whose heart is perfect towards him, whose heart is yielded to God, whose heart is wanting to do what God wants, right? And to show himself strong in their behalf. You know, we think about the stories of Daniel, right? I mean, we'd love to experience something spectacular as Daniel did, as long as it didn't involve being thrown into a furnace, maybe. Um, they were, they had, they didn't know what would happen, right? They just said, well, we're not going to bow down to the image. It doesn't matter what happens. Uh, you can throw us in there if you like. We will not bow down to the image. So they were doing the will of God in a very spectacular way, and God came through in a way. But how about, yeah, Good old Noah, right, sweating in the woods, chopping down those trees and convincing his big boys, come on, boys, let's leave the field for now. We've got to be busy building this ark, right? How was that? How did, what was the conversation around the breakfast table? I mean, they lived a real life too, just like we do. There was Noah. So there was Abraham, right? What did his dad say when he was leaving everything behind and he left on this journey that God had told him? Or Ruth, right? I mean, she made... Like there were no, some of these people didn't have any big spectacular things. They just believed God and they just believed in the kingdom of God and they were just willing to do. They just wanted to be part of God's kingdom and God helped them in that way. And so I believe, I'm not talking from the perspective that I don't think God is working. I mean, we have missionaries here in church. There's missionaries that we're supporting. It's all those things. We're welcoming people. We're being friendly and all of those good things. But maybe there's one or the other here that is, Waiting for something. Are you waiting for something supernatural? Would you like to be a Daniel or an Elijah? You know, it's the same thing with Elijah. It wasn't that Elijah was sitting one day and he was just, you know, doing, going about his work and he was thinking, well, I would like something spectacular. I would like something wonderful to happen. What could we do? Well, let's challenge the king to a contest of the gods on the mountain, right? Let's do that. That would be exciting. That would be certain. And then God could show his power. That was not how it was worked. God came to him and said, you know what, Elijah, this prophecy that I told you to make three years ago that it wouldn't be no rain, that is over now. Go invite Abah to the mountain and then do, the, and he followed those instructions. It was God's thing that he was doing. It was not something that Elijah invented. It was of God's work and Elijah, poor man, what was he thinking as he poured water on the sacrifice, right? He didn't know how the story would end except, but he believed, right? So he was confident. And so I want to call us to, to faith, and there was Joseph, 
I mean, how, that, was, that was something, it was just everyday life had to do with food and grain and harvests and crops. John the Baptist, I mean, the one with uh, eating locusts and honey in the wilderness and dressing in camel's hair clothing or whatever that was, right? I mean, that, how, what was his life like? We don't know. But he went about doing the things that God wanted him to do, the message, a very special message that God had called him to since before his birth, that he would be the man, he would be the chosen one. No one else is called to be John the Baptist. That was just John the Baptist. That was a special thing that God needed to do at that time. And Zachariah's father had to experience that thing there that was all part of a thing that God wanted to accomplish. And so as you pray about the future, um, I, just, I would just like you to encourage us to wait on God, to lead you, to affirm his calling to you. But while you wait, remember to live in the things God has already given. The sign of Jonah, Jesus Christ, the hope of eternal life. You know, you have, we have collectively a calling to evangelize the whole world. Like Brother Lannis preached the other day. Uh, we have the job, we have the calling to do good to the household of faith. And there are many others, like the New Testament is full of jobs for us to do. God has given you spiritual gifts to use, hasn't he? So let me question you, are you using them? Are you using the gifts and the abilities that God has given you? Do that, do it courageously. And as you go, God will lead you, God will help you. The thing is when we're stalling, uh, when we're waiting for God, uh, I mean, yeah, there is a time as legitimately waiting for God, but I'm talking to those who are maybe, maybe you know you're not, not really living by faith. You're not really living by the Spirit. Let's be encouraged to do that. Let's not wait for the spectacular. Let's start with those things that we already know. And actually, the death and resurrection of Jesus, the sign of Jonah is the most spectacular thing that we will experience. Is it spectacular to us? Is it wonderful to us? Is it precious to us that we can be the children of God? Or is that... Just a story in the Bible to us and we like something real, like something today. Well, Jesus is today. Jesus is for us today. Uh, we have on the bulletin the verse from 1 Colossians, 1 Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, uh, verse 9. It says like this, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. Paul speaking and to desire. What is he desiring for them? that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. It's talking about the resurrection power that the Roman soldiers saw. Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So Paul is saying that you will be strong enough to be patient and long-suffering and not just patient and long-suffering but joyfully patient and long-suffering that's a hard thing right it's Paul is saying that's what the power of God will help you to do giving thanks unto the father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and light and it goes on and on we could read the rest of it some very good verses uh, Psalm 37 verse 4 says you know you're you're I'm talking to those who are hungry and thirsty for God but you're, you know, maybe uh, for whatever reason, you feel dry. Has your river run dry? Uh, maybe there's somebody like that here. You know what? Psalm 37 verse 4 says to you, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Right? I mean, where, is your, where do you expect your life to come from? I can't give you life. Neither can the people sitting around you. They cannot encourage you. But where you need to go to is straight to Jesus. And I know life has been hard. Maybe some of us who have, you know, that, that's all true. Uh, I, I'm, I won't minimize that. But the life that Jesus offers, it's the God offers, it's the, I'm calling it this morning, the sign of, G, the sign of Jonah, right? It's Jesus' death and resurrection is et eternal life for you. Um, God offers us eternal life. Jesus says, I'm come to give abundant life. And so my question for you this morning is, you who are feeling dry, you are stalling over the work of God. Um, you know what, are we, are we going uh, to, you know, Jesus says, I have the abundant life. First Corinthians uh, 1, let's turn to First Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 
talks a little bit about, you know, what we would like to see. I think this applies to some of us and it applies to me. Maybe it applies to all of us. It says for verse 21, 1 Corinthians 1 says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. So the wisdom of the world became too big for God, for the wisdom of God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And I know many people, when you mention Jesus, even some Christian people, oh, okay, the resurrection of Jesus, the power of Jesus, eternal life. Okay, yeah, that's just in the Bible. But I want something real. I want something now, today. Well, amen. God will help you if you're going about his business. Do you believe that? Do you believe the sign of Jonah? The God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so, amen, let's have God work in our lives. Let's have something good, let's have something great happen today. And it starts by going to Jesus. It starts by appreciating the sign of Jonah. It starts by loving God. It starts by being on the page with God. And so that's my challenge for us today. Philippians 3, uh, verse 7. Let's see if I find the verse here. I didn't put a marker in. Sorry about that. Philippians 3, 7 to 11 says this. But what things were gained to me, those I counted, Paul speaking, lost for Christ. Yet doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Listen to this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So, do you still believe in your own resurrection? Paul says that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Is Jesus still the center of your faith? You know, after the last couple of years, what is our faith centering on? Hopefully it's centering on Jesus. Do you still know Jesus and the power of his resurrection? Are you in fellowship with the sufferings of Jesus? Do you still believe what he has already given you? Sometimes we pray from the place of, well, God, give me this. God, give me all these things, right? Give me the power. I mean, I don't think about worldly things. I think even about spiritual things that we should be victorious in. God, give me the victory in that thing. Well, doesn't the Bible say that he has given us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places? Maybe we should pray from a position of having it and thankfulness and rejoicing in it. That's called faith, believing that we have the things of God, believing that we have the resources and believing that we have the power. That is hard sometimes. You know, when you're facing a spiritual struggle, that's hard sometimes to believe that we have the power to win. And so if you're sitting here today and you're one, and praise God, there's probably many, most of you who are probably believing and you're strong and you're courageous, but I'm talking to the one who's sitting and you don't believe. Like we had a really good message in the German message, right? That God is greater. What a thought. God is greater. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. To you who are feeling dry, to you who have stopped believing that God or are starting to doubt and you're, uh, you'd like you know, something more than what you have, well, uh, if you are in Christ, you actually have it according to the Bible. We need to walk by faith. Jesus offers us the living water. He says, I am come that I, have, that I can give life, that I will give it, or that I have life and I give it more abundantly. Right, And so I just, I would just like to encourage you um, 
those of you, if there's anyone here that is, that is struggling in, in those areas, I can identify with that. I think we all can identify. Sometimes we are in a place like that. But maybe there's somebody here, you've been in a long time already in a place like that. Or maybe today you are. Well, the answer is to start delighting yourself in God and going to the place where the life actually comes from and to believe the things that God has already given. Let's be strong in that faith and be active in that faith. And as we go, God will strengthen because he wants his will to happen. He's looking for people who will be part of that. So let's pray. Your God, thank you for the sign of Jonah. Thank you for how you help us, even in our doubts, even in our struggles. You want us to win. You want to help us. But God, I pray if there's anyone here this morning who feels like, well, my brook has run dry, like the brook ran dry by Elijah. He was living for you. He was working for you. But yeah, the brook there, even though the ravens brought food, but eventually even the brook ran dry. And so God, if there's somebody like that here this morning, help us to, uh, to see that, that you are the one that offers the living water. Help us to return uh, uh, to you. I pray that you would be merciful and show yourself strong. I pray for all those who are encouraged, as many of us are, and we're being strong and we're working for God and the life, the living water is flowing through us to the people around, to our families and to the community and to, to the ministries that we're part of and the, at the workplace we're a part of. I got, uh, pray, God, that you would help us just to be more courageous. Help us to believe in your very real power. God, help it, help it not to be just something... In, just in the Bible or something. I mean, that is in the Bible, but help it to be real. God, we pray that you would, uh, as, you, as you have promised, when we knock and when we ask, that you will give because it is your desire to give. It's not your desire to withhold. So help us not to be unbelieving. Help us, God, to be full of faith and to give our lives, uh, to yield our lives to, ye, to you completely. In Jesus' name, amen.